Thanks so much, and thank you for being here today. Uh, I will be talking about parent-focused prevention of child sexual abuse, and this is work I'm doing together with Elizabeth Latorno. So this is work in development. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is around um, our work. Uh, well, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is why is it important to work with parents and some of the considerations for how to implement programs with a parent-focused um, prevention angle. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the curriculum that Elizabeth and I are developing and some of the next steps in this work to refine the program and evaluate it. So this figure is adapted from Bronfenbrenner's social ecological framework, and I put this up there to highlight how each of us as individuals is really embedded in a system of different levels of social ecology, right? So ranging from the close factors like our families to more distal ones like policy um, and culture. And our current responses to child sexual abuse uh, really target different of these levels, but one area that's been relatively neglected are parents or caretakers of children. And uh, we believe that this is a really important area to develop as a prevention focus, and a really comprehensive approach to prevention of child sexual abuse will need to involve multiple levels, but parents can be potentially a very important piece of that bigger picture. So what are we doing now in response to child sexual abuse? We've already had really valuable talks on justice system response and the kinds of punishments and monitoring um, that go on in the system, um, along with all of the complexities of that work. Um, we also know that advocacy and media campaigns are in evidence to try to educate the public about what is child sexual abuse and what are the, some of the things you can do to prevent it. Youth serving organizations are also increasingly aware of this issue and there's a big increase in the ways that um, people who are applying to work at youth serving organizations are screened and also trained in how to protect child safety. So that's a really positive development. Um, we know less about how effective all of these developments have been in terms of preventing future incidents of child sexual abuse. We've already heard speakers mention school-based programs. So there, is, there are many more initiatives to educate children in the context of schools about what child sexual abuse is and what are some steps that they can take to be aware and to try to prevent this from happening to them. Um, and again, there is some research in that area, but it's, it's relatively limited, particularly in terms of understanding prevention of future in incidents. And we've also heard today about treatment, which is incredibly important. So treatment of both offenders through cognitive behavioral methods, uh, multi-systemic therapy, um, and also treatment of victims. Um, this work is extremely important, but there are a lot of questions that we don't know, and again, relating to prevention. So for instance, um, we don't know whether treating victims actually pre prevents future incidents of re-victimization, which is a key question. So these approaches are all um, valuable, important, they have their place, but there are limitations of where we're at right now. And one of those is really, um, compared to the number of programs out there, we really have relatively little strong empirical evidence to support efficacy for prevention of, of future incidents of child sexual abuse. And often um, there are factors that make it difficult to do that work. So um, when there's a well-publicized case of child sexual abuse, there's often a lot of urgency around putting some programs into place and not having time for careful research. There's also often a lack of funding for prevention-focused efforts. And some of this is a, an issue of stakeholders perhaps not understanding the full implications and importance of a prevention approach. In addition, research with victims and around offenders often occurs or has historically occurred somewhat separately. And these areas really need to be well integrated in, all, in order for us to come up with really effective prevention agendas. So we've already talked quite a lot about the justice system. Um, 
you know, one thing that's, I think, important to highlight is when we're thinking about prevention, most offenders don't have a prior history. So one study showed that over 90% of individuals who were serving time for child sexual abuse offenses had never committed any sort of related offense in the past. And repeat offenses are actually lower for child sexual abuse offenders than for other sorts of perpetrators. So it's important to keep that in mind because although m much of our efforts are going into working with these offenders, when we think about trying to prevent new cases, we need to be thinking more broadly because we're not necessarily going to be impacting um, other folks uh, who are at risk for offending. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about why parents, why do we think parents are a really important group? And there's a few reasons for this. One is just the incredible amount of influence that parents have on children's behavior. Although as the parent of a four-year-old, sometimes I, I forget. <laughs> it seems like she has a lot of influence on my behavior. Um, but really parents have a profound influence and there's a large literature on behavioral family interventions which have been found quite effective for improving ch children's emotional and behavioral problems. So can we learn from these interventions and leverage those types of intervention skills to be able to work with parents specifically around preventing child sexual abuse? One thing that's very encouraging is that there have been interventions specifically working with families around communication of sexual related topics. And this has been found to um, have positive effects on uh, teen sexual safety. So not only can we work with parents around children's behavior generally, but we can actually work in the area of sexuality. There's some evidence that this can be effective. We also know that um, parent-focused interventions for child maltreatment uh, show quite a bit of promise. And one area that's um, in very promising in particular is reductions in child physical abuse. Child physical abuse is actually the most similar area to child sexual abuse, so this is important. And I've put up here three programs that have encouraging evidence. So Triple P, the Positive Parenting Program, Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, PCIT, and Multisystemic Therapy are all um, programs that are showing really positive evidence in reducing child physical abuse. So how can we learn from these type of interventions in terms of focusing more specifically on child sexual abuse? These programs have in common a focus on teaching positive parenting practices. And I'm going to come back to that because I think it's a really important ingredient of an effective program. And in particular, working on improving parent-child relationships generally is a really good vehicle for parents being able to impact um, outcomes for children. It's likely that key ingredients have to do with increasing parent warmth and control because these kinds of factors are known to be really important for effective positive parenting. And I'll come back to that as well. Another reason parents are so important is that they're, they're so proximal, right? Parents are around, um, and most child sexual abuse, as we've heard, is perpetrated not by strangers, but by individuals who are actually well-known to the family. So whether it's a um, step-parent, uh, uncle, a friend, these are very, very common occurrences. And parents have a gatekeeping role in terms of who comes into the, into the home, who spends time with the child. So making parents more alert to these kinds of issues can really encourage them to take different kinds of protective measures. And this also, this kind of information might also have a deterrent effect for parents who are themselves at risk for abusing. And that's a question for future research. So what kinds of considerations are there for actually doing this work when we think about designing and delivering programs to parents, what, what kinds of things do we need to think about? One is which families would we want to target? So ideally we would want to have a program that's flexible enough um, to be able to work with a very wide range of families. But when we think about where to start, families that are at higher risk are a very promising place to start. Um, now there is no uh, sort of robust risk marker 
for knowing when a family is likely to be to have a child sexual abuse occur, but there are some characteristics that have been associated with higher risk, and I've, I've listed a lot of the most common ones up here. Having only one biological parent in the home, fighting or violence between caretakers, parent substance abuse, low maternal education, poverty, lack of stable child caretaker bonds, maternal mental health issues and child sexual abuse histories, which has come up already. Um, child disability is also an issue that makes um, children very vulnerable, and research has shown that these children are at higher risk for child being exposed to child sexual abuse. So selecting families that have one or more of these risk factors might be a promising approach for trying to reach the families that may be in greatest need of prevention services. In our um, new partnership with the Baltimore Center for um, for child abuse advocacy, the notion that families who have already been investigated for possible abuse, even though if that abuse isn't substantiated, these may be very important families to work with as well. And then we need to think also about when do we intervene, right? Because um, we could intervene at many different points over a child's life cycle. The reported rates of child sexual abuse are highest in the teenage years, but the risk actually begins much earlier than that in toddlerhood. And we do see a jump in risk, um, whereas one to two year olds have less than a 3% risk of being exposed. Um, that jumps to 14% for toddlers who are age three to five. And this is an age when children are you know, increasingly beginning school, they're being exposed to new adults and older children, so it's a period of increasing vulnerability. And we believe this is actually a really important window for reaching parents, and that's where we're focusing our efforts right now. And then there are a lot of settings for prevention efforts. Um, Elizabeth mentioned when introducing me that I'm interested in sort of how do we embed prevention services in different contexts that serve families. And we need to think really carefully about this because if a program is going to be feasible and sustainable over the long term, it needs to be something that can really be embedded in existing services um, in a really seamless kind of way. So here are some settings that serve children and families that may be promising for us to think about. This includes primary care clinics, child advocacy centers, home visitation, WIC, Department of Social Service agencies, and also federally mandated early intervention services for families of children with disabilities. And we need to keep thinking about this list as we you know, move toward the vision of really being able to, to reach families across a really wide spectrum. And I should say that in some ways this, this work is very challenging and, and that may be why in some ways parents have not been as much of a focus of prevention efforts. The work that happens in schools, in some ways we, we have an easier way of reaching children in schools, but um, it's often hard to connect with parents around this topic. So that's also why it's particularly important to partner with agencies and find a way to have them help us in reaching families. In terms of the kinds of things that we want to target when educating parents and providing them with skills, low levels of parent knowledge about child sexual abuse is very important. Uh, many people don't have a lot of information about this topic. Um, poor communication with children about sexuality is also a risk factor. So parents who may not feel comfortable talking with their children about topics related to sexuality are going to have a much harder time engaging around these issues and that may put children at higher risk. Lack of structured parent oversight, this monitoring piece is also really important because of the role of parents as gatekeepers and being able to have some um, more structure around the kinds of exposures that children have. We also know repeated practice is really important for getting new skills. So it's one thing to read information on the internet and learn something, but it's another thing to get very detailed information about actually what do I say to my child? How do I do this? And that may be part of what's key in changing parents' behavior um, with children. And there is actually a lot of really valuable information already on the internet. So um, organizations like Stop It Now and Darkness to Light have very, um, very valuable information on child sexual abuse and prevention online. 
Part of what we need to do now, though, is really to package these strategies in ways that are feasible for reaching families um, and for giving them a greater level of detail and ability to practice skills. And of course, as a researcher, uh, really understanding how can we rigorously study these interventions and see what effects they have. Engaging parents is difficult partly because of the nature of this topic. There's a lot of stigma surrounding the topic of child sexual abuse, and a lot of people find it creepy, right? So many families may think, well, this would never happen in my family. Why would I need to engage with a program like this? Or for some families, perhaps families where there are more risk factors, there may be fear. If I get involved with a program like this, what if I'm doing something wrong? What if Child Protective Services gets involved? So there may be a lot of reluctance from that end. Parents' own mental health or addiction issues can also be a big barrier. Talking about these issues can be very emotional, can trigger past traumas, um, and can be something that may be a bit overwhelming for parents who are struggling with their own mental health issues. And that's important for us to think about as well. And paradoxically, the households that we really want to reach, those that have more risk factors, may really be the ones that are much more difficult to reach. And I think, again, that's why it's so important to partner with agencies who work with these families and try to find ways of engaging families positively. And again, coming back to the concept of framing within um, the notion of positive parenting, this is a really important way, I think, to reach parents um, and to align with their goals and their desires to be good parents rather than um, making the approach so narrow that it's just about child sexual abuse, which uh, it can be quite off-putting. <laughs> So our ideal vision for a prevention program would be one that offers a continuum of prevention services because different families are going to require different levels of intervention. And more intensive supports are likely going to be needed for families that are dealing with more risk factors, more challenges, and mental health issues for the parents. Um, so for example, we may need intensive individual or group-based formats that are actually facilitated by mental health professionals for, for families where there are really um, quite a lot of risks, whereas um, for other families, self-administered versions of a program might be adequate. So you know, this is part of what our goal as researchers is, is to try to determine what modalities are going to fit best for which types of parents and what level of intensity is needed. So I already mentioned sort of the, the ability to leverage existing interventions that have evidence support behind them and to potentially adapt some of their core components, some of their approaches when we think about building a curriculum around child sexual abuse prevention. One other potential is to actually um, develop some modules that can be embedded in existing interventions and that also may be a way of leveraging the work that's effectively being done now. The idea of a, a tiered or a stepped approach with diversity of programming options, um, such as used by Triple P, is a very appealing one, and that's something we'd like to work toward. And then in terms of evaluation, um, there are a number of things to think about. So often it's really, really difficult to evaluate one of our uh, most important outcomes, which is changes in incidence in future occurrence of child sexual abuse. Um, it's easier to start with proximal outcomes like parent knowledge, their attitudes and beliefs, their self-efficacy around being able to, to protect their children. Um, but ultimately, we do want to work toward measurement of incidents, um, which can be done using parent or child reports, social service records, police data. These different kinds of data have different strengths and weaknesses, of course, but can, you know, can begin to give us a picture of how interventions are working. It's also important for us to really examine what's going on in our intervention so that we understand what are the core components, what are the mediating mechanisms, what's the pathway of change, because once we understand that, it's much more easy to apply these skills flexibly across populations. What is the optimal dosage of a program? How is it best delivered? And what are family factors that are associated with response? So knowing that parent mental health I issues, for instance, may influence response is an important thing for us. 
Finally, it's very important to promote stakeholder buy-in, and I think the you know the Moore Center has been doing really incredible work, um, you know, not only in these individual research projects, but I think building awareness more generally of the importance of prevention. Um, there have been long-standing barriers to uh, strong research agendas focused on child sexual abuse prevention. And I think we're seeing growing awareness of the importance of this. But stakeholder buy-in is really critical for funding and for supporting program evaluation and dissemination. So um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about uh, the model that Elizabeth and I have been developing and what the curriculum looks like and some of the next steps. So first, I'm going to show you here, this is a sort of very uh, preliminary hypothesized intervention model of change that has guided our work in developing a curriculum. So our notion here is that if we develop an intervention that includes components such as a rationale for preventing child sexual abuse, um, messages of empowerment to parents that this is something you really can have an impact on, and then specific skills, um, skills training and ways for parents to practice, um, that this kind of intervention has potential to increase parent readiness their knowledge, their beliefs, their attitudes, their self-efficacy, and their behavioral intentions. And that readiness, in turn, may lead to some really positive um, implications for how parents are interacting with kids. And we're conceptualizing this really around two key pieces. One is the communication piece, parent-child communication, um, both the quality of communicating between parents and kids, but also um, parents being increasingly able to communicate around sexuality-related topics, such as accurate naming of body parts, how to say no, what are boundaries between you know, your body, what's, what's private, what's yours, um, and the other piece around monitoring, so parents being more aware and more adept at monitoring and supervising what's happening with children, so investigating babysitters and youth-serving organizations that children may come into contact with, dropping in when children are spending time with babysitters or other adults alone, and being really more alert to signs and signals of something being possibly wrong. And we believe that these, these sort of components, in turn, may lead to a reduction in future child sexual abuse incidents. And this is, of course, um, what our future work will test. So in terms of the curriculum we've developed, it has four key sort of chunks or modules in it. The first is around basic knowledge. What is child sexual abuse and inappropriate sexual behavior with children? How can you as a parent help prevent them? And I should note that this is not only around prevention of one's child being victimized, but also if one's child is showing evidence of inappropriate sexual behavior with other children, how can one respond to that? Um, parts two and three, in a way, are really the meat of this intervention because this is the piece that we feel parents need more specific skills in than what they might be able to find online. And this is around communication, talking to your child, and safety monitoring. Finally, um, the fourth chunk is around making a report and how parents could go about reporting suspected abuse of their own child or another child. I should also note that we've tried to plant seeds or encouragement throughout this curriculum um, to, to really encourage parents to think about their own um, histories and their own potential mental health needs and really encourage parents to seek help for that and provide resources and information. So some of what we think are really key aspects of the curriculum um, that differentiate it from other um, information that's available is, again, this explicit focus on skills um, and also framing these skills broadly within the context of positive parenting and appealing to parents' desire to be able to have strong relationships with their children um, around sexuality and other topics as their children grow. Um, in addition, the notion of having guided practice with feedback and self-assessment of strengths and weaknesses for parents. 
And there are a number of possible modalities that we're considering at this point. Again, these modalities are going to depend a lot on our partnerships with different uh, organizations and the types of families we work with. Online training, as I mentioned, may be a way of reaching a lot of people very broadly, but with less um, individualized support. One thing that um, we're very intrigued by is the notion of online training with Skype feedback from a professional online where parents could actually get some direct sort of real-time feedback on how they're, um, how they're doing with skills. One-on-one -on -one training is also an option, particularly with people who provide services to families, such as home visitors and advocates who often have really close relationships with families. And group formats are another way of reaching folks. So in terms of next steps, a really critical next step for us is our growing partnerships with service agencies. And we've had um, conversation with Department of Social Services about potential links and ways to work with them. And also, as Elizabeth mentioned, with the Baltimore Child Abuse Center, we've recently had a um, very positive meeting with and are very excited about the potential for collaboration and linking with the work that they do um, with families um, where there is some suspicion that abuse may have occurred. Um, one of the things that's going to be very key for us moving forward, especially in our partnerships, is to really get feedback from families. So what do families think of the curriculum we've developed and the potential delivery methods that we're thinking about? And what do providers think? So again, really trying to make sure that the programs can be embedded within organizations serving families. When we um, finish conducting focus groups and interviews, we will use those data to refine the intervention content and the delivery approach. And we'll then do a pilot test of the program that will lead to, hopefully, um, the ability to, to get larger funds to do a larger scale study on the program. So in summary, Child sexual abuse, as you've already heard from others today, we believe it's preventable and that that is an achievable goal and that focusing on parent-based um, prevention strategies is a really promising way to move the prevention agenda forward. Um, we believe parent-focused prevention can also ultimately be really well integrated with prevention approaches at the school, the community, and the society levels. And that is it. I just want to acknowledge again the Moore Center for funding the preliminary development efforts for this work. Thank you.